I try not to let my some of my personal preferences color my presentation too much. But I will say, if you want to know what I don't like about something, listen to what I'm not saying about a knife. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 76 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. The Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like Bob and you. To learn more about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anybody who loves knives and is in the knife industry. And we've got a a great interview show coming up today, Bob, on our uh, our Sunday interview edition, if you will. That's right. That's right. We're going to talk to David C. Anderson of the Knife Center today. If anyone, uh, if uh, you all out there watch knife videos like I do, you know who David C. Anderson is. He's the digital media marketing manager over there at Knife Center. And he's been putting out these amazing videos over the last, I'd say, year, digging into the new knives of the week. And they're, they're, uh, they really give a, not only a look into what's new and what's coming out, but also into the heart of a knife junkie, which uh, David C. Anderson is. And I hate to speak for him, but I'm going to, I'm going to label him that right now. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sure he'll let us know, but I'm sure you're right. All right, we're going to get into that uh, interview with David C. Anderson. But first, I want to remind you that if you like shopping and you like saving money, then you need to hear about this. You can get cash back for your purchases using Ebates, now known as Rakuten. And because you're a loyal Knife Junkie listener, if you're not already a member, you'll get $10 for joining if you go to the knifejunkie.com slash cash back. It's easy. If you happen to use Google Chrome, you can use their Chrome extension. So whenever you go to eBay or an online knife merchant, uh, Rakuten will pop up and ask if you want to use their link and save money. It's that easy. Just shop like you normally would and get cash back. So go to thenifejunkie.com slash cash back. Sign up. After you spend $25, you'll get $10. Thenifejunkie.com slash cash back. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. I'm here with David C. Anderson of the Knife Center of the Internet, or Knife Center as you know them. Uh, David is the digital marketing manager, and uh, lately, I'd say over the past two years or so, he's been putting out amazing videos on YouTube uh, and and has really uh, invigorated my, my buying instinct. <laughs> well, that's what I'm trying to do. Great. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nicely done, sir. Mission accomplished. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you, David. I, I feel you're like one of those uh, guests that I kind of feel like I already know because I've watched so many hours of you, you know. But I just wanted to relate to you my first experience with the Knife Center. It was in 1998, I believe. And I think the very first knife I got from there was the Cold Steel El Hombre, the four inch Vaquero uh, mm. serrated. And then it's the most interesting purchase still to date from uh knife center was uh my 2000 emerson commander and it's interesting to me because i saw it and i lusted over it for about a year and then i mustered up the cojones to spend 200 bucks on it even then 200 bucks i bought it and i weighed it and i was expecting this was like probably my third purchase on the internet my third like uh interaction with the uh purchasing on the internet and Mm -hmm. i was expecting it to show up the next day and uh it didn't and then it didn't and then it didn't and then um i wasn't very good at email back then it it ends up uh the knife center sent me all these emails okay they're going they're making it they're, right now they're tooled up for the CQC7 <laughs> but they'll be on your commander next year and i didn't read that email and so i forgot about it and then eventually like uh a year and a half later knife center got it sent it along to me i totally had forgotten about it showed up at my desk at work and I was just praising you guys. Anyway, that's my long way of saying thank you for, for being there and doing what you do. Well, it was a little bit before my time there, but that's awesome. That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> and you mustered up the courage to spend that much money on a knife, and it was all downhill from there, wasn't it? Yeah. It, oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, I don't call myself the knife junkie for no reason here. Mm. Um, and actually, the funny thing is, is uh, my brother and I I, I, I told him that I was going to be speaking with you, and he's like, oh, God. Because he always liked how the packages arrive. Center of the internet. 
And, uh, you know, it's very discreet for the wives and everything. And, uh, I was just, I was just thinking I never signed up for the, uh, the frequent flyer miles on Knife Center. What a fool. Oh, what you a, got to. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'd be, a, I'd be, a, I'd be rolling around in hinderers on my bed right now. <laughs> Closed, I hope. Yes, indeed. So, David, sorry for my long and gushing oh, intro. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, but, uh, tell me, how did you get to, the knife center and how did you become such a knowledgeable knife person? Well, I mean, we all kind of have our, our journey, don't we? Um, I'd say mine started definitely in the boy Scouts as a kid. Um, I'm sure I share that in common with a lot of folks out there. My first good knife that I ever had was actually my father bought it for me. Uh, I don't have it unfortunately still. Um, I have the replacement for it. The first one's at the bottom of a latrine uh, at a campground, <laughs> but it's a Camillus three bladed uh, BSA whittler. It's very, very similar to a stockman still have the replacement for it. And yeah, man, when you're a kid, there's nothing more fascinating than, you know, let's be honest, weapons of yes. any sort. Yes. Um, and the uh, for a lot of us, a knife is the closest we're going to get to any kind of weapon. Um, but quickly it became more than that all the way leading today. Now it's this totemistic thing that we all carry and can't be without feel naked without. Uh, but that, that kind of lit the spark initially. Um, and then after I got out of college, you know, with, when you factor in the, the internet and all the information you can find there, it kind of re sparked that. And it was kind of just picking up everything I could learn after that point, um, just absorbing information, trying things out. Buying knives from Knife Center, actually, back in the day. I was living in Maryland. Knife Center was still in Maryland That's at that right. point. Uh, I still remember the first time I, I I was looking for a Benchmade. I wanted the the fixed blade Griptilian uh, was what I was looking for. Huh. Yeah, I they made a, remember that one. They made a fixed blade version of it. Um, I was a big fan of Doug Ritter, still am yeah. uh, to this day, and he has his, had his collaborations with Benchmade, and there was a fixed blade version of it. Hmm. I couldn't afford the Doug Ritter version, but I could afford the uh, the standard Benchmade fixed blade version. So I, I looked up their website, found a list of dealers, found the Knife Center's address, drove over. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I get there not realizing it's an Internet-based company. You know, I just found their address on Benchmade's website. And uh, they're like, well, do you have an exact change? I'm like, no. Like, <laughs> it was a whole debacle. The job I was working at the time, or at a, a little bit later than that, it was it was problematic because I could place an order and drive over on my lunch break and pick up a knife. <laughs> oh, God, oh, that is a problem. It is. <laughs> and it was kind of neat. Um, this line sounded good on my resume when I uh, came and interviewed for my job when I started working at the Knife Center. But every time I went over there, they were a little bit bigger. They'd expanded a little bit out. They moved to a different side of the building that had more room. They created every time it was a little bit, little bit bigger. And now I get to contribute to their continued growth. It's pretty neat. That is amazing. So you are the digital marketing manager. Yes. So I, I watch your, I love your weekly knife updates. Thank you. Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, you get to see everything that's new or, or a lot of what's new, the hot stuff. And I'm just as excited by that as you guys watch and believe me. Well, that's exactly what I was going to get at. You can tell, you can really feel your love for what you're talking about in those videos. I also like, I, I think the way you produce it is good. It's like, it's kind of off the cuff. It's not too formal. And, uh, you're just, you're, it's like a dispatch. You're, you're just getting mm -hmm. the news out. And, uh, but your, your love for what you're doing is apparent and, uh, if if you also love that you, you you like to have a commiserating uh force and and that's what you are I love I love those uh those videos how much in terms of like researching what's out there and and seeking how much do you have to do with bringing in new material like stuff that Knife Center sells honestly it's I I go through our list of new items every week and I pull a bunch of stuff I take a look at them. Um, a lot of times, you know, we've got pretty good descriptions on our website. A lot of my research initially comes from, from those. Um, we have other people who are adding them, adding the products to the website and, and doing some of that research. Um, but a lot of it, honestly, I've used so many knives these days. I've written about knives for so long. Actually, that was my kind of entry into the, um, into the whole knife world was writing uh, for the a blog. The Truth About Knives? Yes, the Truth indeed. About Knives blog, yes. Um, and that actually, going back to your previous question, 
that opportunity and the number of people I met doing that really brought a lot of knowledge and a lot of learning that I was able to pick up. And a lot of these these new Knives of the Week videos, I, I'm just applying my years of, of knowledge and experience using and writing about these things to kind of scrutinize, see what's going on, and just try to give a, a, a pretty honest impression to our viewers. A thing I like about those videos is that I think you walk a very fine line. You're there to sell every knife, but you obviously have your opinions. Indeed. But when I can tell that you're expressing an opinion, you're never harsh and it's never, but it doesn't seem like I'm just trying to sell this to you. So I'm, I'm yeah. going to ignore the fact that this hurts my thumb. You know, you're very, <laughs> you seem very honest, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're there to, to get eyes on that product. And... Absolutely. Yeah. That's my job. That's, you know, how I put food on the table. That's my paycheck. Uh, but I, I try to maintain the same ethos I did when I was writing for the truth about knives and with a, a title like that, mm -hmm. truth, it's right, right there front and center. So I'm not going to get up there on camera and say something I, I don't think is right or I don't think is true. I d obviously do have things I like and things I don't like. But then I have to remind myself there's people out there that may be different. You know, certain people like certain things more differently. So I try not to let my some of my personal preferences color my presentation too much. But I will say if you want to know what I don't like about something, listen to what I'm not saying about a knife. Interesting. Uh, uh, elaborate. If, if you're reading between the lines, you can kind of tell by what I'm not talking about the way things might fall. Um, a, a quick example, let's say a cold steel AK-47 fixed blade. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar, it's got a blocky handle, yeah. um, uh, a lot of you know heavy G10 traction. If I tell you this handle is, is designed for aggressive grip and it's never going to fall out of your hand, <laughs> I'm not saying... That it's comfortable and free of hot spots, am I? Right. No, you're saying it hurts like hell, but if you got gloves, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> that that's you know just a little example right there of of what I mean by that. You know, I I caught a little bit of that in your last video. That um, at the the very first knives they were uh, they're from Spain. They're lockbacks, and there are three versions. The Castillos. Yes. yes. Well, when when you got to the last one, the Navaja. It, it has just a more appealing blade. Just, I don't care who you are. It's a more appealing looking blade. And you kind of said that, uh, it, uh, but you didn't say that, you know, because you don't, you don't want to turn off the person who really likes that super traditional yeah. spear point blade. Yeah. You know? And that's the thing. I'm putting the information out there for everyone else to, to take and uh, apply their preferences to. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, at the end of that video, you show off a, a 1900 page paper catalog from, I do. <laughs> from Knife Center. And I'm like, oh my God, every bathroom in my house needs that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean that as an insult. You know what I mean, right? Oh, no, absolutely. Works great next to a toilet or on a coffee table. Yeah. Or, or at the desk at work. It's like good stolen time reading yeah. material. It's oh great to just, just leaf through it, kind of take a look at stuff. I mean, I remember looking through catalogs and looking through magazines and heck, newspaper advertisements every week when I was a kid, you know, pre-internet days. But yeah. man, something kind of cool just about turning the page and finding something new that you weren't expecting. Oh, yeah. I mean, like you won't catch me reading a book on Kindle. Uh, you know, I, I still like the paper and a paper catalog is 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 awesome. I, mean, I, I grew up in the Bud K days and the mm -hmm. and the um you know, when REI didn't have storefronts and it came in a. And, you know, like a mimeographed paper, th like, so I'm, I'm, I'm old, <laughs> I, I'm of a different generation, but I love that paper catalog and the fact that it spans all of the brands that Knife Center has. And you said uh, that it might even have knives that aren't even on the website, which to me is astounding. Absolutely. Like that's a yeah. amazing thing. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Well, kudos to you, sir. For bringing that to us, we all. Uh, I just, I just get to show it to you. I didn't have anything to do with making it. <laughs> <laughs> well, something you do uh, have a hand in making are Nordsmith knives, which I wanted to talk to you about. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I've been watching you for, I guess, two years since you've been making videos. Something like that. Getting close to that. Yeah. And uh, only it was maybe three videos back, you showed a Nordsmith knife, and I was like, I didn't know this guy. Also designed, yeah. made, and produced and sells knives. That's amazing. I want you to tell me about them. And then I want to, I want to read from you. Actually, I'll do this first. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind. To me, this is very interesting. The story of Nordsmith Knives is the story of taking control of my life and not just letting events happen to me. 
I choose to control my destiny. The only way to find what you seek is to take matters into your own hands. The same has been true for generations past and will continue to hold sway for generations to come. And you're, you're kind of tying together your, your ancestry, your grandparents come to this, this country from Norway mm -hmm. and then, and then how you've continued on kind of their, um, self-reliance by making knives. And, and, uh, to me, that is like a very, um, compelling background story. Tell, tell me what led to this. So, um, I guess I had been writing for the blog, uh, for a couple of years. And I think I had just been to my first blade show a few weeks prior. And it was a Friday afternoon, getting ready to leave. And my boss calls me. This is not the knife center. This is pre knife center days. My boss calls me into the conference room at the end of the end of the Friday. I'm like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> it turned out it was sort of like an impromptu evaluation and I didn't see it coming. Uh, but he asked me that that question, where do you see yourself in five years? Which neither at that point or at any point in my life have I ever been able to answer that question. Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> I'm a little better about it now, I think. But at the time, not no, not having an answer and being taken completely by surprise by the question, my mind went blank. And this one thing came crashing in. I, I'm telling you, I was still riding high off of the my first Blade show. Hmm. And I... All I knew for certain was that I wanted to be more involved in the knife industry as a creative force, not just a writer. And it would be cliche, but also true to call it this moment of clarity that I didn't know what it was going to look like yet, but I knew it was something I had to do. And, oh, I guess you asked a little more specifics. Um, so I spoke to uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's my, now my lovely wife, and I knew I just had to do something. And... I had met L.T. Wright uh, mm -hmm. through my writing at the blog, fantastic maker and an even better human being. He was the second person to know that I wanted to do something. Um, he was working at a, a gun show in Chantilly, Virginia that same weekend. And that's where I went and met him initially at the uh, in the blog days. And so I came up to him the next day. I was like, hey, L.T., I got to do something. And before I could say anything extra, he's like, let's make you a prototype. Mm. That was it. That was the beginning. I had some, I started working on some sketches and I had some ideas I knew I wanted to approach. Um, basically, it's another kind of cliche. There was something out there that I, or there was something that I wanted in a certain knife that I could not find anyone doing. So I had to make my own. What was that? That is what turned into the canteen knife. It looks like a Nesmuk, right? Kind of like a big butcher knife Nesmuk. Yep, I'm a big Nesmuk fan, but I wanted a – what I had always been looking for was something that was a camp knife first, but could do rocking cuts on a cutting board and pull off some convincing, if not, you know, 10 out of 10, but some convincing food prep work like a uh -huh. chef knife. Yes. Still to this day, no one's doing it – you know, I may be showing my bias here, but no one's doing it as well as the canteen knife does it. Nice. And I've been looking, believe me. Let me just put a little uh, parentheses here. What do you think of the Topps uh, chef's knives? I've been looking at them. I'm like, is that just a giant? Is that is that a Prather war buoy except shaped like, <laughs> is it too thick? I love Topps. You can't say anything to, to turn me off. So I see this is where I have to walk a fine line. Um, indeed, indeed. <laughs> I'm not personally a huge fan of their, of their uh, kitchen line that they came out with. Mm -hmm. um, I think the... The chef knife doesn't quite have the balance that I'm looking for, mm -hmm. uh, but the Dicer, Dicer 3.5, I think they call it, the small one that they're marketing as a pairing knife. Yeah. Man, throw a sheath on that. That would be a phenomenal hunting knife. Huh. And I really think that's that's my favorite knife out of their kitchen lineup for that reason. I'm, I'm not surprised by that answer. You know, they're not a kitchen knife maker. You, you can't expect to knock it out of the park your first first time out without it being pure luck mm -hmm. and you know they're so so excellent at outdoor and tactical you know uh military and combat knives give them two more seasons and maybe they'll <laughs> they'll they'll be uh grinding it thinner i will say their frog market special uh kitchen knife is That's pretty cool. darn cool here's a little sidebar i made a larger frog market special for a friend of mine and um because I've, I've made a few i've dabbled you know, around here, I had the heat treated somewhere else, but uh, 
uh, that was, he wanted a chef's knife. I made it for him. He loved it. And then he couldn't cut onions with it. And then I took it back and I made it a lot thinner. <laughs> and uh, it's not easy to do to make chef's knives. No, the, the grinds are even more precise than anything else out there that you have to do. Let me get back to Nordsmith sure. while we're here. You have four models. Currently, yes. Currently. Uh, my personal favorite, if you don't mind my telling you, is the Lapwing. My proclivity is more towards weapony knives. I just, mm -hmm. it just is what it is. Done a lot of martial arts, but not only that, I, I, you know, I grew up, uh, uh I was a child of the seventies and all the TV shows, every man had a knife on him. There was a lot. And then, and then when I was a teen in the eighties, all the, uh, Stallone and Schwarzenegger movies, that's just how I tend. And I look at the lap wing and I'm like, that would make an outstanding EDC. Because it's, if you need it to be weapony, you could, you know, but it looks like it's got an extremely, um, versatile sort of utility blade to it. So it's got both of those things I like. It's got, uh, it's got a sort of an aggressive spirit, but, you know, it's, it's about taking care of business. It's not like mm -hmm. a, an assassin's knife. Yeah. It's a, it's a thin, narrow blade, which has worked well for centuries. I mean, there's a reason the paring knife still looks like a paring knife, <laughs> you know? And that, that was a knife that, that was the, the third release. And if your canteen knife, like in, in terms of my tool usage of my lineup, if your canteen knife is your outdoor slash chef knife, then your lap wing is the bird and trout slash pairing knife that goes okay. perfectly with the canteen knife. But it makes, it does make a great EDC with that, that thin, narrow blade. Um, I actually do have a customer who uh, made an inside the waistband Kydex sheath for it mm. for use as a self-defense carry in, as well. That's how I carry fixed blades mm -hmm. uh, in the kind of the small of my back mm -hmm. inside the waist in, in Kydex. And that's exactly what I was thinking when I saw that. Who makes these? Do you make them or do you have LT Wright make them? So I work on all the prototypes myself. Very early on, uh, before I kind of knew what I was doing, I actually trained with LT to work you know, he showed me their process. Uh, he actually does classes that anyone can take. Um, and I've, I'm actually one of three folks that have gone through the entire catalog of courses he offers, Wow, which was incredibly helpful. One, it helps me in my design process. And two, I use LT to produce the knives that I sell on my website, Nord, nordsmithknives.com. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he does a better job more quickly than, than I'll ever be able to do, I think. Um, so he handles the, the production side of things for me. I've got a great relationship with him, but all the prototyping I do in my shop here, I get things buttoned down, ironed out so that they're perfect. I send him a drawing and my prototype and we're off to the races from there. And on the last couple of, uh, the last three releases, the, not on the canteen knife, but on every other one, I've been in the shop on the day that the first one gets <sighs> finished. <laughs> cool it's really it's awesome lt and i have the knife in our hands and like he takes a little off here he hands it to me i look at it i take a little bit off here <laughs> and we're kind of shaping the final thing together it's it's great it's great that is really cool and 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 if i may may be so bold it might be encouraging for a customer to say i love the design of this but who's david c anderson i'm not mm -hmm. sure about his knife making cape oh made by lt right holy mackerel it's mine you know what i'm saying like yeah absolutely Knowing LT has opened so many doors for me, just in terms of meeting people and just of reassuring people that, you know, people who know who LT knows that he only hooks up with people he believes in. Right. So I've got that kind of built into my product, which is, I, I it's never been it, on my website. You can tell it's not something I shout about, but it's not something I hide either. All right. So David, Norway. I'm a big fan of the show Vikings, and my mom is reading a book right now called I can't remember what it's something like Death is What We Strive For. But basically, it's 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 uh it's a book about the Vikings, and they talk about how it was actually more glorious to die in battle than to be victorious in battle because in your death you could show what you're made of. And I thought that was an interesting concept. It's 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 not what I have in my blood, but I I think it's mm -hmm. cool. Have you ever considered making a sax? I can't say specifically I have. Um, I've been working on a few prototypes of some cleavery type of things, however. Mm. So my my background, 
like I, my dad cooked a lot when I was growing up. And so I picked up a lot of stuff from him and I, I continue to cook a lot myself. Mm-hmm. And the, if you drew a Venn diagram of my influences, you've got the outdoor knives on one side and all of that stuff, the bushcraft, the camping, the survival, Oh, camping and survival, uh, wilderness survival merit badge and boy Scouts. Best thing ever. Mm-hmm. But then you've got my whole kitchen side of things. And if you move that Venn diagram over that little intersection where the two of them overlap, that's where I really like to be. Yes, okay. uh, that's it's what I can speak to with authority. It's what I know. I don't have to pretend I know something that I don't to work in that arena. Right. That's what does it for me. And that's what I'm keen to explore. Huh. Yeah. I, I see what you mean there. It's like, yeah, you could, you could do a sax because it's part of your cultural heritage or something like that, because it might fit in the Nord Smith line um, in terms of its uh, aesthetics and theory or whatever uh, background. But if it's not, if it's not something you would use and if it's not something that you truly, you know, if you're thinking more about outdoors knives than weapon knives, a sax might not be the first thing that comes to, comes to mind. You, you've got my mind working though. I, I'm wondering if there's a, <laughs> I'm wondering if there's sort of a kitchen pattern that could be sax inspired a little I, bit. I, I bet you there might be something. I kind of think there is. <laughs> but you're right. No, I, I try to stay authentic with my designs. And I'm fortunate in a way, because this is a side project that I've con- been able to continue working on, I don't rely on it for income. Uh, in fact, I've never <laughs> paid myself any money out of the out of the uh, company at all, um, which I started with, opened a checking account with there's either two or three hundred dollars in it and everything's come out of that, which is That's it's awesome. pretty cool. So sort of pays for itself self perpetuating. Yeah, yeah. So a lot everything goes back into the company except, you know, working on more things. Um I guess you could say I paid myself by buying some knife making equipment with the money, but yeah, you know. right, right. um but like I said, I try to stay authentic to what I know. And because this is a side project that I don't need to rely on for my main source of income, I don't have any pressure to release a new knife at any time. If I don't think it's perfectly 100% ready. So you don't have a titanium frame lock flipper? I don't have a titanium <laughs> frame lock flipper in the works. <laughs> the, but that's actually where the uh, my skipjack knife came from. Because as soon as you tell anyone you have a knife company, they're like, you know, make a, a folder and pocket knife. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why, but I've got no interest in designing a folder. I got into designing fixed blades because there was something I wanted I couldn't find. I've always been very happy with the folders I've carried. So I... I I never got inspired to work on that sort of thing. But the skipjack pocket knife, which the blade shape's kind of inspired by uh, by smaller chef's knives, just scaled down to a, a a much smaller blade, but it comes with a leather sheath with a pocket clip on it. That's my pocket knife. Oh, yes. I, okay. I was just looking at it just right now. Yes, and, it, and, and that handle shape looks like it will fit in the pocket nicely how do you um carry it do you have some sort of special pocket shaped um leather sheath that you put it into or is it yeah so um all my sheath work is done by jre industries uh mm-hmm. spen stelzer one man shop out of illinois making really great work and it's it's one of his standard patterns actually just with the top lopped off and we attached a pocket clip to it so you can carry it right inside the pocket just like anything else all right. Well, you got my mind going now. <laughs> I uh, frequently carry a fixed blade, and I frequently carry multiple knives. Okay. And granted, we all do. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Just as long as we're swimming in the same waters here. Indeed. Um, sometimes, uh, I well, I like to carry um, fixed blades surreptitiously, you know, if you will, nothing egregious. But I, I think that um, it's something that makes people freak out a little bit so you got to be very careful about it but i think that if people start introducing the idea of fixed blade edcs especially if they're in your pocket and not like i have it stashed in the back uh i I think if you just have an edc pocket knife that's fixed you pull it out it gets people oh interesting for a while i was carrying this uh bark river mini sax you know in my front pocket and it it fit beautifully and it it did the work great, and I carried it for, you know, three weeks while I was really into it. And then you, you know how it is. You move on to a different knife, and mm-hmm. now that just occupies my desk for the mail I don't open. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I really like the idea of the fixed blade EDC. Anyway, I, I, I hope that people start 
uh, you know, people carry that skipjack for that purpose. And that that was the the genesis of the name of that knife. Well, being a Maryland guy, of course, it's their, our state boat. The name is essentially skip the jackknife, put a fixed blade in your pocket. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Yep. I was just thinking of the tuna, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the times now, the knife industry. Sure. And um, I first want to ask you, not what what were the most popular knives from the Knife Center, but what to you were the best knives of 2019, or not even the best, but the ones that resonated with you the most? Well, it's funny, um, because we've just finished wrapping up a bunch of our uh, 2019 wrap-up videos on our uh, on our YouTube channel, so you can certainly see some of my thoughts there, but man, one of my favorite things from last year is so unassuming. It was actually my pick for my favorite thing from SHOT Show last year, the Old Hickory Hunting Knife. Interesting. I love this little thing. You know, people have been taking their butcher knives for years. You've got 1095 steel. They'll shorten it up, make a bushcraft knife out of it, knock the handles off, do something fancy with it. Well, Ontario is leaving money on the table. They're like, let's get a piece of this. So the five and a half inch bladed version with the, the regular handle scales, leather sheath, 20 bucks. Come on. <laughs> okay. It's, you said it's 1095, right? Oh, yeah. I was at home, uh, home being Ohio, uh, visiting my parents over Christmas, and I, I was checking in with my, my dear old friend and uh, his wife. And his wife, is a, she's a master at everything food-related, and she's great at the, the big green egg, you know, smoking mm -hmm. giant pieces of meat. She's like, oh, you're a knife guy. What should I get? I really have my eye on, and she showed me that knife. And she's, and she, it even comes with a sheath now. <laughs> and I was like, why are you asking me? I think you have your answer. That is, it's so cool. And it's kind of Bill the Butcher, too. You can, you know, you, you can put it in your vest and, and look menacing mm -hmm. at the same time because it has that upswept clip point kind of shape, which to me is kind of piratey. And, uh, yeah, I love it. It's a, it's a great little knife. And like I said, for an American made $20 outdoor fixed blade, it's a pretty good deal. Okay. So I think I'm, I think I'm talking about something in the same line, but a little bit larger. So the one that you're talking about, you said 20 bucks. Yeah. The, the one that comes with a leather sheath is, okay. is 20 bucks with a five and a half inch five blade. Five and a half. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, yeah, okay, yeah. We are talking about the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So that's your pick. So what about 2020? What are you excited about? Oh, more fixed blades. More Bring them on. <laughs> I, I, the things that really get me going, like I'm, I'm a fixed blade guy. Always excited to see new kitchen stuff as well. I'm probably mm. more, more critical of, of a chef knife than I am of anything else out there. So it's really hard to please me in that regard. Um, so I'm just excited to see what's going to come up there. And as far as companies to watch in 2020, SOG. Interesting. They're uh, they're primed for a, a bit of a comeback, I think. Uh, I've talked to some of the folks behind the scenes. I like what they've been saying to me, and we're starting to see the fruit of some of their, their projects, which I'm excited about. I just mentioned SOG, and uh, we do a, an interview podcast on Sunday, and then we do kind of a Where I Get to Talk About Knives podcast on Wednesday. And I was talking about the, the SOG uh, 2020 releases, at least as uh, illustrated by Knife News. Everything I saw there was an improvement. The, uh, the Pentagon looks cool. The way they, the way they kind of redid the Pentagon. First of all, a major deal with SOG, people bristle at, at their billboarding, as, as people like to mm -hmm. say. But, you know, for a while they got into putting their name into a lot of different places on the knife. And, and I can see, like, it's a fine line. Uh, Kershaw was doing that, that K texture pattern, uh, for a while in their GRN. And that was like, that was okay on certain knives, but uh, I, I I feel like SOG kind of just took a turn for the, for the, for the great. And uh, I've always been a huge fan of their fixed blades, especially their more traditional kind of leather stacked handled fixed blades, like the mm -hmm. Mac V SOG and the, and the fighter and the, and the Pen Pentagon or whatever the others are called. Um, I've always liked those knives. I've never been too into their, um, folders but the flash they just redid the flash that looks great yeah they're updating all of their stuff eventually I'm, i believe they're going to run through everything in their lineup and they're using their new xr lock all over the place which mm -hmm. feels really good that terminus xr with the d2 blade and yes. that xr lock for 50 bucks give me a break that's fantastic 
Oh, I'm sorry. Terminus. Yes, that is cool. But I was thinking of the the big one that just the Steel XR. Yeah. Also aw- <laughs> so awesome, cool. awesome thing. <laughs> that is so cool. So that XR lock is that actuated only from the thumbs or the from one side, like the no. thumb side of your. Uh, no, it it runs through. It's you know obviously they can't call it an axis lock because Benchmade still has the rights to that name. But it's a similar. Um, kind of- it's a similar style. We've been trying to actually been kicking around at the knife center what do you call that kind of lock without calling it an axis lock and we've settled on crossbar oh perfect i was gonna say bar lock yeah Yeah, it's it's a perfect it's a crossbar lock they're doing that really nicely and what's nice about the way sog is doing it is as soon as you pull the the bar back the blade kicks out just a little bit what do you mean kicks out so the, the blade starts to open just a little bit they've essentially ramped the tang of the knife so that when you pull the bar back it starts the rotation. So it's already in motion, basically, if you go to do the little uh, centrifugal. Uh, okay, so when it's them. closed and you're opening it with the lock and you pull the thing and, and you pull the, the lever back, it kicks it out a little bit and starts it on its way. Just a couple degrees. It's not going to open it all the way, but it gets the job started for you. God, which that's awesome. Just a, and that's part of why they've been able to get the, uh, the flipping action to feel good with that style of lock, which has you know, traditionally been a bit of a problem area for that style of lock. The, the SOG knife company story is a very interesting and cool one. Uh, Nothing Fancy a few years ago did an interview with, uh, I'm sorry, I forget his name, but the, the chairman of that company. And he was talking about the, the genesis of SOG knives and how he discovered the Mac V SOG knife from Vietnam and, you know, had a couple produced in Japan and brought it to a knife show. And then, you know, everything just sort of tumbled, mm-hmm. tumbled from there. And, uh, I don't know. To me, those kind of stories are compelling, kind of like your story, because what you, I want to circle back a little bit to Nord Smith, uh, what you say in your um, biography on your on your website or, or your sort of inspiration resonates with me because, you know, I'm at a stage where I kind of feel like that, too. You know, hmm, I need to take more control over my destiny and mm-hmm. and, you know. Uh, I'm I'm happy, but I'm not doing exactly what I want to be doing, you know. And, and I I have always kind of wanted to be uh, more involved in the knife world, also. And so that that stuff resonates with me. With Nordsmith knives, how much like uh, time do you work uh, on the um, like? Do you design on paper and then start working on the on the prototypes, or do you design on CAD and then? And then kind of feed it into a machine. How does that work? So I'm a pencil and paper guy to start okay. things out. Um, with all of the, well, I, I do do kind of some random sketching of just some some knives, and I oftentimes will make some of them uh, in my my shop here, knowing full well I have no intention of it being a a Nordsmith in particular. Okay. But for for everything that I've done so far with Nordsmith, it all starts with a a purpose driven idea. Or I'm, I'm trying to design a knife to fill a certain niche or to do something I want it to do. And I start to work from there. And in my head, I have an idea of sort of what I want it to do. And I start sketching around that parameter until I have something that looks good. Uh, from there, I'll typically cut it out of cardboard and see how it actually fits in the hand. And I'm, I'm not done. When I draw it, it's not just what looks good. I'm, I'm applying my kind of experience to it and what I know works. And once I get a cardboard piece that orients the blade in the direction I want it to be going, that I think is going to feel well, then I'll proceed to do a steel prototype. And yeah, that that's kind of the where, where it comes from there. And I will say this, bl- designing a blade is super easy. Designing a handle is not. Okay. All right. So I need to jump in here. You mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned this a lot in your... Um, in your knife center videos about how the handle orients the blade. And I think that is so cool because no one ever talks about that. Mm -hmm. I love Filipino knives and Filipino blades and, and um, they take, you know, special attention at how Mm -hmm. oftentimes in Filipino blades, the, the, uh, the angle is almost a a little arresting when you look at it, the angle to, to blade ratio, but it's because it, accelerates what they're trying to do there it accelerates the cutting that they're trying to do absolutely and uh i've always thought about that because when you thrust with a filipino knife you you need to do very little in terms of your wrists so you say it's much harder to design a handle do you mean to design a handle in the context of the entire knife or just to design it 
to feel good in the hand. Well, you want it to feel good in the hand, but even more than, well, not more than that, I should say, Com handle comfort is, especially on a fixed blade, is utmost importance. But does the handle allow you to do what you want to do or allow you to do with the blade what you want the knife to do? Does it support the mission of the knife? Does it support the uses of the knife? That's what I mean by that, essentially. You know, it's real, and it's technically it's easy. You know, you've got the, uh, the Kephart style handles out there, you know. That's easy, right? Quote, unquote. But the, the canteen knife is a case in point. The first prototype to that knife, I, was, I actually cut out of an old hickory cleaver. Oh. So it had a straight handle on it, which... I knew the blade was exceptionally versatile, but how am I going to design a handle that unlocks every last ounce of capability and versatility in that blade shape? Right. Which is why you have the, the angle of it where it joins the steel part or the, when it joins the sharpened part of the blade is so important. The, the handle on that knife allows you to choke back, which then not only are you adding extra leverage, it's also altering the angle of the blade when it makes contact with what you're cutting. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of every little curve on a handle changes the way the user manipulates the blade when they're using it. And it's a lot harder to do that than draw another drop point blade. Yeah. 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 And, and I see, I'm looking at the, at it right now and you've got those little thumb scoops, you know, for when you're mm -hmm. holding it sideways. And I would imagine you have to design those or create those in such a way that they don't, chafe when you're using the knife in other ways and you're choked up and you're carving or mm -hmm. uh, I'm not much of an outdoorsman though I would love to be it's just not how it is but I I would imagine if you're carving sticks you know I do that for our fire pit I'll make little feather sticks I've watched enough nothing fancy <laughs> but I would imagine after doing that after a while the contours of the handle really start to matter you said especially in a fixed blade Especially in a fixed blade designed for actual use. Right, because presumably you're using that for a much longer, for harder chores than you are with a folder. So a folder will be comfortable for a while, but you're not going to be using it for that long, that hard. So when you're actually uh, designing that handle, <laughs> I mean, I feel like when I'm drawing handles out, because I like to draw knives, you know, like we probably all do. I feel like I know what looks comfortable. And then when I've actually taken the steps to actually make them, I discover something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what you're talking about with you and LT Wright kind of passing the knife back and forth. How does yep. this feel? How do you... Yep. And yeah, the, it's not until you actually get that 3D piece in your hand that you know the, the whole truth. The drawing is just the start of it. Yeah. It, you know, I've drawn things out that I think look awesome. I think are going to feel good. I do a pretty good uh, build on it. Looks great. I hold it in my hand. I was like, hmm. <laughs> The swell's in the wrong place. It's too far forward. Well, got to change that. <laughs> right, right. Well, so, okay, so where do you see Nordsmith knives in five years? Oh, <laughs> there's your, Lord. There's your question. <laughs> <laughs> Had to do it. I, I really like what I've been able to do with it uh, as a side project, mm -hmm. quite honestly. Um, I don't see – because at the same time, I really like what I've been able to accomplish and been able to – the opportunities I've been able to execute at Knife Center as well. Yeah. Nordsmith is likely going to continue to be a side project that I continue to work on new models. Uh, I need to get a few more pieces out there for review to get some more interest going. But I've had a lot of good luck in that arena with some of my uh, the contacts I've made in the print industry, especially. The Canteen Knife, in fact, was on the cover of Knives Illustrated last year, which was really amazing. I've said before, there's a lot of people who have worked longer hours and much harder than I ever have who haven't gotten that opportunity, which I, I'm forever grateful for. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've, I've got more designs. I've got one in particular I think I'm really close to having nailed down. And I got a few kind of cool things that I've been working on. Uh, unfortunately, the Knife Center gig has taken a bit more of a front burner seat for a lot of my knife energy. Mm -hmm, uh, sure. But I am looking to change that this year and, and ramp a few things back up. Uh, along that arena. Cool. Well, I think it will be good for your future, for Nordsmith's future that you have, that you're so adept at this digital marketing. I know Knife Center is uh, benefiting greatly from the stuff you're doing because I, I have to be 100% honest. And for a while I was like, you know, I was watching the Blade HQ videos. I'm like, where the hell? And, and also GP Knives and a couple of others. I'm like, where's Knife Center? They're the first ones, man. I've been with them forever. And then you popped up and I'm like, 
There we go. It was kind of a uh, a match made in heaven. Uh, it came at a time where I realized that my old job was I needed to make a change, and they kind of it clicked. Things clicked into place. I came over there, and yeah, we didn't know exactly what I was going to do when I interviewed, but we we just had to get me in the door, and it's kind of evolved from there uh, with me taking over the the front of the camera stuff and. Which, man, I, I actually find really funny for because for so long I've been a print guy. I've been a written word yeah. guy. And now I'm, I'm the for better or worse, I'm the digital face of Knife Center. I, I think it's for better. I, I And I relate to that, too, because I've been in production for a long time producing, you know, videos and producing podcasts and such uh, for work. And uh, now I'm doing this for, you know, my own interest and fun. And I'm like, wow, here I am in front of the mic. <laughs> what do you think of that? And, but but you know what? When you have like a true passion and you just like to talk, the way I see it is it's better that I sit in front of this mic and talk about knives than talk about knives with everyone at work and with my wife and everyone. They, they all know we, we can have those conversations too. My wife definitely has it a lot easier now that I have someone else, a camera to talk to instead of just her. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, is your wife into knives? Have you gotten her anything? Hopefully not pink handled. She's not super into knives, no. Um, the first gift I ever got her was a knife, actually. <laughs> <laughs> My man. <laughs> but uh, it was one of those little CRKT turtle knives, little Ashworth turtle uh, yeah. versions that they did. It was it was so stupid <laughs> when I gave it to her. I was kind of like, eh, I'm not sure if you're going to want this or not, but here. you know. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, well, because it's from you, David, I'll I yeah. love it. <laughs> but yeah, no, she's gotten a lot of use out of that. Um, but I will tell you, she... She knows what it is to appreciate a, a good, well-designed knife. If you, you should see what I've got on my uh, my knife magnet in the kitchen. I've got an un- some some amazing customs on there that I just love. We won't talk to about how expensive some of them are. It makes me no, want to no, say no, hey, you know, But my favorite one by far is um, a cook's knife that was made for me by Big Chris. Big Chris Custom Knives. Who went? You may have seen him. He went viral uh, a year or so ago doing the blade sports cutting. Oh, the the big large guy in the orange t shirt. Yes, yeah, great guy, heart of gold. And it's it was funny to me when he went viral for the blade sports things, which is a big chunky cleaver blade. Yeah. When he loves a super thin oh. slicey blade. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've got a kitchen knife from him. It's ten v steel. What the hell is MV steel even? <laughs> well, it's seven more than three V, don't oh, you? Oh, know? okay, I got you. <laughs> All right, it's nice and thin. It cuts like nothing else I've ever felt. Really cool handle on it. Bone linen micarta with oh, red liners. Dude, perfect balance. It's amazing. I loved it. I spent a good good amount of coin on it. Waited over a, a year for him to to get on it, and it was worth every day and worth every dollar. And the first time my wife cut something with it. This has never hap- happened before with anything else. She cuts through an onion or something, just slice. Wow, she says. I was like, yes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Accomplished. <laughs> oh, man. That's nice. Okay, let me let me just ask you, uh, what do you think of Michael Zeba knives, uh, the, the kitchen knives? Have you ever held one of those? Do you guys sell those? We do occasionally when we are able to get them in. Uh, I don't have any oppor- or haven't had any opportunity to actually use one. Okay. The ones I've held, the balance is quite good. However, actually, the I forget the name of it now, but um, it's got this larger one. It's about a ten inch blade, I want to say. And one of the things I look for on a lot of kitchen knives is that area right back by the heel. Yeah, do a lot of cutting there. There's a lot of cutting that goes on there, and I prefer a knife that doesn't have a completely straight edge at the back of that heel because I find it's it's less comfortable when you're cutting on a cutting board. It tends to clunk down when you're doing rocking cuts. Interesting. But if it's too rounded over, you've got no control over it. So there's a fine line where with just the right radius at the heel of the, the chef knife blade right there, you can come down on a cutting board and there's a definite point where it stops, but it's this soft rock. One, it's easier on the wrists, but two, it's just that extra bit of luxury feeling. And I remember his, those larger chef's knives of his we had in had that and were felt really good. But my favorite knife of his actually is the MS3. 
the small flipper he's got, which oh, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that knife. That's really cool. Do you know, um, do you know Alex Tissot, Alex's knife box? I don't know how much YouTube you watch. Oddly enough, being on YouTube so much, very little. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like the pizza maker who doesn't want to eat pizza. It's either a blessing or a curse because I get to, I kind of, not that I put blinders on, but I'm able to get up there and do my thing without being colored as much by what other people are doing. That is what we want from you, David, actually. You know, speaking for myself as someone who who patronizes the Knife Center uh, a bit, you know, I, I, I want to know, you know, I don't want too much of that. But what I was going to say is that little that little flipper, he's got like this this backspacer, these little skulls piled up as a backspacer in that Michael Zeba flipper. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a skull guy. I don't like skulls like as a motif. It's just not my thing. But on that knife, I'm like, damn, it's it's, <laughs> it's hard to resist. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so uh, tell everyone where they can find Nordsmith Knives, how they can find your work. And uh, well, everyone knows where to find the Knife Center. Everyone knows the Knife Center. They're, they're the guys. They're the guys. Um, knife Center, of course, we've got our, the YouTube channel, uh, our Instagram, Facebook, all of that. You can find links to all those at the bottom of the Knife Center page. As far as Nordsmith, I'm at NordsmithKnives.com. On Instagram, as Nordsmith Knives. And we actually have a private Facebook group going called the Nord Haven, one mm. word. And I encourage anyone who's interested uh, to go check us out there, request to join, and we'll... I'll get you approved right away. And there's stuff that shows up in the Nord Haven that never makes it to the website. Stuff you mean stuff to buy? Stuff to buy, some Nordsmith stuff, some some one-off handle materials where we do something a little cool with something. Stuff like that will go up in the Nord Haven before it goes anywhere else. Now now that we're wrapping up, if you make a sax in the future. <laughs> You're really angling for this, aren't you? <laughs> I am. Would you make it with a stag handle? Have you ever used stag? Do you use stag at all? I haven't used stag because I want to be able to offer a good warranty and because yeah. uh, there's a bit of the added expense, me being – if anything comes back for warranty, there are certain things I can do here in my shop, but a lot of times I may have to send something back to LT. Sure. I haven't had to actually do that at all in – with any of my knives yet. And I've got knives from Alaska to Australia to the UK. Wow. Worldwide at this point, which is very humbling to me, in fact. So I try to, I tend to stick with the, you know, Micartas and G10s, the stuff that I know is going to hold up very well. <laughs> yeah. There are a couple of wood handled lap wings out there or so, not, not straight wood, but uh, some hybrid wood, like some shock wood stuff that's mm-hmm. gone out. And the first run of the skipjack actually came with green jigged bone. Ooh, oh my god! Which was I love sick. Bone. I oh. love that. And on a fixed blade, holy on the little fixed blade, green and yellow has been the signature colors. All the first run knives get a first stamp and green and yellow. Uh, gr- typically green micarta and yellow liners, but for that skipjack fixed blade, it's this bright, brilliant green jigged bone with a yellow liner. Looks phenomenal. So there's a. There's a few bone skipjacks out there as well. That's class. I mean, that's true class. You pull a you pull a a sweet fixed blade out of your out of your pocket. It's got green jig bone, mm. and then be like, Nordsmith, what's that? It's like a little piece of pocket jewelry that also yeah, cuts man. stuff. <laughs> it is. It is. David C. Anderson, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Like I said before, I I felt before uh, before we started talking that I I know you, and now I know you a little bit better. Uh, keep pumping out those awesome videos on YouTube. And uh, I love what you're doing for the Knife Center, but I also really love what you're doing with Nord Smith Knives. Thank you so much, man. And again, appreciate it so much. Thanks for having me on. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. And welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast. Great interview with David C. Anderson of the uh, Knife Center the uh, original and largest online cu- uh, catalog of cutlery, and as they like to say, the best place to buy knives online. And I know, Bob, uh, I think you said that was your uh, your first foray into the purchase of knives. Was, was it was my knife first. Center. Yes, it was. It was my first foray into purchasing anything online. Oh, so wow. uh, they yeah. are in my uh, digital DNA, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really great talking to him. I've, he's another one of these people that uh, I meet and I feel like I already know because I've watched them so much online. It's right. kind of stalkery, actually. Right, <laughs> but right, right. I know you. Uh, but it was great to to meet him and to really uh, 
Um, you know, I like talking about his heritage. I like that his heritage plays so much into his love of knives. And I really appreciate David's connection to the past, his Norwegian heritage, and uh, looking back to the generations that brought him to where he is and the sort of self-reliance they practiced uh, and the strength uh, they they uh, embodied to to come over here and and uh, allow opportunity. I just like that 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 is what feeds into his knife design. And you know what else, Jim? I think I may have convinced him that a sax is a uh, a valuable pursuit. I think he might make one. You know, he is Norwegian. Well, only time will tell, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. In which case, if he does come out with one, I will be uh, obligated and delighted to to find one and purchase it. Right. Well, I found it interesting. I personally uh, did not know about Nordsmith knives uh, when you guys uh, started talking. So I found that uh, really interesting, not only uh, heavily involved at the Knife Center, of course, but then, uh, you know, having his his own knife company on the side, if you will. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely a busy man. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And and uh, truly an inspired uh, uh, knife enthusiast. I uh, want to remind you that uh, we've got our supplemental edition coming out on Wednesday and also uh, Thursday Night Knives, our live video show on Thursday. So if you want to uh, find out how to uh, listen or watch both of those, just go to thenifejunkie.com. We'll have links to the podcast, links for you to be able to subscribe, a link to Thursday Night Lives, the live video show. All of that can be found at thenifejunkie.com. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. want to say thank you for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.